but it's humans who are making life better. I'm not saying no humans make life worse, okay? You know, again, I have I know people who are Yankees fans. Lots of Yankees <laughs> have made the world worse. But on average, humans make life better. So the way I talk about it like an economist is I say the expected value of every person is positive. And so that means the more you have, the more positivity you're adding to the world. So humans make life better for other humans. So I want to start with a good life, and then I'm going to get into your story. But every time now that I say the phrase living the good life, an image of a friend of mine who's, who's now a late friend, Jerry Hume, mm -hmm. is one of the longest serving members ever on the board of the Heritage Foundation. When I first went to meet him as I was just starting at Heritage over two years ago, he lived in California. He said, Kevin, do you know what the most important objective of the Heritage Foundation is? And I sat there, you know, I was still experiencing the fire hose effect, taking stock of everything that Heritage did. And, I'm, and I know that this, this older gentleman's quizzing me and I was trying to think of the right answer and then I was just honest. And I said, Jerry, I don't know. He said, living the good life, mm. reminding Americans of what it is to live the good life. Yeah. And so I came back and reported that to our staff and it kind of became our rallying cry. And then unexpectedly when Jerry passed away last year, it really became our rallying cry as a way of not just remembering him and his service to this country and probably to some organizations that, that are dear to you as well, but also for the work that we do in the United States. And so your book, which we'll talk about full time, in a lot of ways is about living the good life. What inspired you to do this? I am a um, incorrigible political junkie, and I've tried not to be. I honestly have. If I could go to a rehab for it, I would. I was um, literally walking door to door for Reagan when he ran against Carter, and I'm not that old. I was five or six years old. I had I asked my parents for a subscription to National Review at that age, and I've I still to this day am deeply politically involved, but I'm hyper convinced that there is lower hanging fruit at people finding the good life in the subject of this book than there is in the results of a given election and, and so forth. Um, there is a sense in which I am a beneficiary of what I talk about in the book. Um, I've had some rough things happen in life. I entered adulthood without parents. My father passed away when he was 47. He was my hero. He was a Christian intellectual, absolutely brilliant man and my best friend. And he died when I was a freshman in college. And work has been the avenue throughout my adult life by which I have maintained uh, activity, usefulness, found dignity, and yes, I believe a bridge to the good life. I think the good life is certainly broader than just work, but I have a very ecumenical understanding of the good life. There's an Aristotelian context many could use. I'm very sympathetic to different traditions in the Christian faith, myself as a more reformational Protestant, um, I think that there's a sense in which the uh, idea of shalom that, that a lot would talk about, the good life, this has a context to it that cannot be separated from work because I believe that we are made in the image of God to be productive. And I think anything in public policy that takes away from that agency, that productivity is a travesty. But I especially think it's a travesty when we do it to ourselves, which is really what I think is happening to the culture now. And we'll delve into that. Yeah. And, 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 and yet, before we do that, I'll make the observation that given what some of the audience may know about your professional, not just background, but your achievements, they might find it a little striking yeah. that, not that you would believe something like that. I don't, I don't think that there's that kind of dissonance between people who have achievements in, in, in the world of business and faith or good life writ large. But to hear someone say that, as you just did, so powerfully and so succinctly might be a little striking. So in addition to the, the, the elements of your personal story, including the tragedy of your dad's early passing, that no doubt were formative, was no doubt formative, what, what else is your story that would allow you to say what you just did in a way that is kind of surprising? Um, I believe that I've spent most of my adult life looking at a Christian church that is largely addicted to mediocrity. And I believe that there is a sense in which uh, this is a byproduct, not uh, being despite their theo theological convictions or, or ideological commitments, but because of them. 
that there is an escapism often embedded in in people of faith. There is um, they can be easily intimidated by elites, by high producers, by a sort of meritocratic environment. And I so firmly believe that whether it be politics, but particularly arts, media, finance being my chosen, uh, my calling, um, we have an opportunity to do a lot of good in society. Um, there's inerrant goodness in these fields. And for us to relegate ourselves to the sideline and then complain about our betters and how they're doing things, I've never been real content with. And so I feel very motivated by the idea of us. Uh, there's talk about, always about the left having gone through the various you know, pillars, the commanding heights of, of culture and whatnot. It, this is not just that. This is not just, I want us back in charge of society. I really love that idea. But I also want the waiter to feel the dignity that comes with his usefulness or her usefulness. I also want the future Broadway star who is currently a busboy to appreciate the beauty of the journey. Um, I've made it to a, a very high level on Wall Street and I live a wonderful life, but my favorite parts of my life were the journey getting at this point. It isn't being here. I actually miss those days more of the struggle and that sounds somewhat easy for you to say type of thing and I get that but I really want people to learn to celebrate the journey. Um, Arthur Brooks used to talk about that concept of earned success. And I think that the good life context you started off our conversation talking about, there's a real Tocquevillian notion in, in strong communities in America, and we can associate good life with that. But none of that was ever separated from a Puritan work ethic and a sense in which we were just creating and building new things. Uh, I think the 2023, 2024 economy has an awful lot of DNA in it from 1776, from 1820, from the, we, we live off of that. And I fear that right now we're at risk of losing it. And then we look around us in the present tense and I know the life I could have ended up having. Um, that alienation and that people talk about the, the various deaths of despair at times. I think it's a real phenomenon. I don't think the media exaggerates it. So the data is pretty clear. But uh, we talk like work is a the problem creating it. And I think it's a solution to this problem. We'll delve into that solution. I want to hang for just a moment on your your comments about the, the jobs we have or the experiences we have along the way that maybe in the moment, while we're, we are grateful for them, we're perhaps spend a little too much time thinking about what's coming next yeah. rather than appreciating the the value of each of those steps toward a journey that we ought to have confidence is going to work out for me it was working at a at an outfitter an outdoor outfitter in my hometown in the gulf coast i mean almost literally amid the swamps of mm -hmm. louisiana and people thinking how are you selling high-end backpacking gear. I mean, the highest point nearby was 44 feet at the, at the <laughs> elevation at the elevation of the airport. Um, the, the swamps, of course, the kayaks and canoes made sense. We sold snow skiing gear. But the point was the small business that was owned by a, a one family, uh, actually until recently, taught me almost everything I know about business. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated the job at the time, but because I knew that I wanted to do something else down the road, in hindsight, I look back and say, boy, there were some moments I wasn't grateful enough yeah. for that being part of the success that I've been able to have. And so as I've gotten older, especially working, most of the people at Heritage are far younger than I am and sort of developing that mentor relationship, which really comes through in this book, but also I would argue for you and in, in your entire life's work, it's important for us to talk about those things. And, and all of that comment leading up to a question on behalf of many in the audience who are younger than you and me, who might be looking to you, they might be tuning into this podcast just to glean some advice. Let's say that they're 25 or 30 years old and they're working in the political policy space, mm -hmm. whether in DC, maybe in a state capital. They, they, they know that their career is going to evolve and perhaps they'll, they'll rise up the ranks, so to speak. What advice do you have for them about balance, about work, about appreciating where they are now? 
Well, one of the things I have a whole chapter in the book about is you use the word balance, and and you didn't modify it with uh, what a lot of people do this work life balance. Because I just read your book, so now you now you know I'm I'm against the idea of work life balance. People go, come on, what are you talking about? Well, first of all, I have been married to the same woman for 23 years. We do have three kids, one of which is now in college, and so you know we have a long ways to go on our journey, but so far so good. And she's put up with me, and and I've worked an awful lot of hours, and she actually works in the business now. We get to work two together, which is a wonderful thing. But um, that wasn't because we balanced it all. There were some days that they didn't see me. And then other times they saw me more than they probably wanted to do. And, and you figure those things out. But what I do believe, and again, this is extracted from my, my faith commitments. Um, I believe in a work rest paradigm. Um, I do believe in rest. And I believe that God created the world in a way that gave us a sort of uh, model for this. He did it with six to one and uh, commanded us to do that. And uh, that's good enough for me. The, the notion now of uh, I interview young people that uh, want to know in the first interview, um, what the work-life balance is like and, and what the gym membership amenities are and what the, uh, you know, pet insurance is and things. And I'm all for people having better benefits than maybe we grew up with. It's, it's not a, in that's my, a good thing. It, it can be, it's, it, uh, you know, I don't want to be guilty of that in my day, we walked through the snow kind of cliche, but there is a sense in which I think that, um, they have the ability to think about some of that stuff because of the prosperity that we have enjoyed. And we have the prosperity as a result of the work ethic. And so I don't want to bite the hand that feeds us. We need to sustain this prosperous culture. We can't do that from without a rigorous work ethic. And you can't do it with a European style um, commitment to work, 32 hour, 24 hour work weeks. And this is something to me on a policy level that I'm quite sure is coming. I think there will be great, we right now have better understandings culturally of what work ought to be like from the Department of Labor and from unions than we do from our own lived experience. So entrepreneurs would never have any idea what it means to have a 40 hour work week. Uh, farmers would have no idea what it means to have a 40 hour work week. But the idea that this is sort of a birthright, um, I think is problematic. Now, look, we, we have better technology, better efficiencies. There's gains in productivity that maybe don't require quite the same grind. But you know, we I think that's a mentality that, that I worry about. And, and that is something that um, ultimately is embedded in where we are taught in school, where we go to church, uh, our own family experience. And that's really the subject of the book. What does it take to change that? Because it's pervasive. And I'd say that, you know, not on behalf of, of you and me as, as two middle-aged cranks. Yeah. Because I think I can speak for you. We have far more love for the younger generation and appreciation oh, yeah. than perhaps is, is conveyed generally, but it is pervasive yeah. and it is problematic. How do we fix it? Well, there's so much talk over the last uh, 20 years, uh, first on the kind of populist left uh, about income inequality, wealth inequality. And um, I think that a lot of the anti-meritocratic moment we're living in, uh, that these days is more couched in political correctness and a sort of critical theory moment, DEI and some of these things. I think it is anti-meritocratic at its core, and that should be the nature of our rebutting, because here's the problem on a declining work ethic. The top 20% aren't going to play along. They're not interested in your 32-hour work week or 40-hour work week. They will keep working 60, 70, 80. And I'm sorry, but they're going to then out-earn and out-acquire. And if people think wealth inequality and income inequality is bad now, they have no idea where it's going in a society that is 20% running with motivation and 80% deciding they're willing to sideline themselves. And it isn't really 20, 80. It's 20 at a high level, 30 that take themselves out and 50 that then ask to become a ward of the state to some degree. And I think we have just simply got to not tolerate that culturally. Um, some of my prescriptions are a little more difficult than others. Uh, I'm reasonably sympathetic to Charles Murray's idea and his book coming apart that I think we have to shame some people along the way. I think it's intolerable that so many people who are successful and have lived a good life, that they will not, what does he say, they don't preach what they practice. I, I think that what I am trying to do here is, is preach what I practice. Um, a big thesis of the book really comes down to, we've really created a ethos that work is something you do so you don't have to do it anymore. The retirement culture is a byproduct of the fact that we started living longer 
and that we had more money. And then Madison Avenue caught on and started marketing the idea of a 25-year vacation. And it's great that we were living longer. Life expectancy we went to 60, then 70, then 80. That's a good thing. And that we had more money and you had 401ks and pensions and things that enabled it. But um, I don't like to have a 30-year-old being told that the reason I work is so that one day I won't have to do it anymore. I want them to feel that there's actually more meaning and value in their work. And then that mentorship thing you brought up before becomes so important. Uh, I myself really want the counsel of 65-year-olds. I don't want them golfing five days a week when they could spend a couple days a week helping someone like me that wants their counsel and direction. Uh, and frankly, I oftentimes want the 65-year-old's advice more than the 25-year-old. As much as I love the 25-year-old's, I'm not sure I need them to run my business for me right now. You know what I mean? That's a byproduct, though, of the environment. We've sidelined some of our best talent, and, and I think it's awful. One of the things that struck me during the pandemic was how quickly Americans were ready to accept that their neighbors were like simply vectors or even pathogens themselves. And so that's what really bugs me is this, it, it points to two things. One is this demand for sort of sterility, that we should be able to control our lives and keep it perfectly clean. But even more, a view that humans are actually good. <laughs> Imagine <Right>? that. <laughs> we're good. Like, let's have more of us. We're good. But you don't believe that if, if you just see a new baby as 58 tons of carbon dioxide or whatever, or if you believe some of the critical race theory stuff, um, America's just incurably racist. Well, then if you're a white parent, you're like, I don't want to make another racist. And if you're a, a black parent, you're saying, do I really want to raise a kid in a country that's going to hate him? So all these things teaching us that we're not good, that's ultimately what's what's at the root. But you're also right. Community cohesion is is a core thing, and, and we don't have enough of that right now. And, and uh, as I would presume is, is part of this book project, to introduce a new topic to our conversation, the environmentalist religion is, yep. is part of this too. I mean, we, we see this explicitly on intelligent forums like Twitter, yes. where people are actually making this claim, don't have kids, it's only going to harm the earth. It goes straight to your point about reminding people that humans are good. We we actually exercise, for the most part, a rather virtuous dominion over earth. I sort of do a mathematical calculation in this book where I say, like, just on a material level, is human life better today than it was 500 years ago? Yes. Was that an improvement on 500 years before that? Keep going back, and we're clearly materially improving. So... What's the cause of that? So it's possible that space aliens are making our life better, but no evidence of that. It could be lizards or lizard people. It could be just climate change is making life better. Sometimes it does. But I don't think that's what's been going on. The steady straight line, the best bet is that it's humans who are making life better. I'm not saying no humans make life worse, okay? You know, again, I have I know people who are Yankees fans. Lots of Yankees <laughs> have made the world worse. But on average... Humans make life better. So the way I talk about it like an economist is I say the expected value of every person is positive. And so that means the more you have, the more positivity you're adding to the world. So humans make life better for other humans. But then there's some a point even more important than that. Even if a regardless of success, and this gets back to like the worry about travel team or my kid going to get into Princeton or get a good job – None of that matters. Every human being is infinitely valuable, regardless of the impact that they have on the world. That's a, a sort of spiritually heavier lift. But for a lot of my readers, I just want to say, like, look, you know, the average person has made life better for everybody else. So, um, you know, let's keep going with this, especially when you look at Western Europe, and the U.S., and the the birth rates. The birth rates are falling in every country in the world, basically, except for Israel, where I'm going in uh, the end of October. And, you know, hopefully I can come back here and talk about that. But that'll be in the book, too. But if the whole West is seeing really low birth rates, and the rest of the world is seeing falling birth rates, we can set aside the, the worries about overpopulation that were o always overblown. And when we like, were kids, I mean, that that was dominating absolutely. even mainstream commentary, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there's a New York Times op-ed when I was a kid uh, that said, we have to teach our kids that overpopulation is the biggest problem. And it's by a principal of the John Pettibone Public Middle School in New Milford, Connecticut. I visited the John Pettibone Senior Center in New Milford, Connecticut. A few, it shut down the school because of a lack of enrollment. So, yeah, I think their predictions were A lesson off. there. 
a lesson there. So what do we do about it? I mean, I, I, I know you, you tend to gravitate toward the cultural and social responses, and that's very good. So people not familiar with mm-hmm. your work at AEI should be. But I'm curious, although I'm very interested in those things, in, in what we do in terms of policy. Because I think one of the healthy conversations in American conservatism today, and you're very much part of this, as, as your colleagues at AI and mine at Heritage are, is, is there a policy response, especially at the federal level, that can aid this? Yes, and I, I definitely think there might be. As oh, a conservative, okay. There's a caveat. As a conservative, I know we don't know what the unintended consequences will be. So I'll start with what doesn't work and is getting pushed wholeheartedly by Elizabeth Warren. By the way, let me just say, and you know this, and not that it would bother you because you're a yeah. Mets fan. That's not a, a leading question. At Heritage, we're grappling with this. And yes. so it's not like, you know, you're going to violate some Heritage orthodoxy yeah. about this. Don't 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 sweat this. Um, no. And so the first thing is um, spending money to subsidize child care doesn't work. Um, the Amen. Pl- the people who say it does, they'll point to France. You know, France, <laughs> one of the things they do, when you have a child, you or your wife gets a government paid basically maternity or paternity leave for up to three years. And then when you have a new child, it starts again. So it's basically a stay-at-home mom bonus because 90% of the people take it are mothers. A stay-at-home mom bonus paid for by the government until your youngest is, is three years. So that's what causes France to have the highest fertility rate in all of Europe, in my opinion. But um, again, daycare is subsidizing work. I think work can subsidize work. I believe capitalism is how we get people to work. I don't think we need the government to do that. But um, the other the things that have the most promise are just cash for having babies. So Marco Rubio and Mitt Romney have both spoken about this. I love the way you put that. I mean, this is very plain. Cash, uh, cash for, having, for babies. having babies. And so sometimes it's when you have a baby. It's some people give out a birth bonus in some countries in Europe. Um, some places it's a, a large child allowance, like a very large uh, child tax credit. That does seem to have an upward effect. I will say it's very expensive. And what uh, some of my colleagues at AEI, like Scott Winship, worry about is it could discourage work. And my first thought is if it discourages uh, one of the people in a married couple from working, is that bad? And his counter argument would be, well, but a lot of these are going to be single mothers. And if they're raised with no idea of work, then it has intergenerational poverty. So right there, I just, boom, touched off what we could have a 90 minute panel discussion. Wait, you got to come back. With all talk our, about Israel, talk about that. And we need to get all our favorite friends to talk about that. Um, on the local level, I talk about walkability. Sound like a liberal there, but when this you is can, your Greenwich Village, yeah, when you can let it. your kids walk to school, that makes it easier to have more of them because then you're not driving them off to school. And uh, there's uh, anything that makes housing more expensive is anti-family. So there's lots of policy fixes on the federal level. I do think we have to have this debate about you know, um, I'd, again, not subsidizing daycare. I think that's a huge mistake, but subsidizing family by saying you are going to get a larger child tax credit. And another way of looking at it is just from the tax uh, code in general. A bigger family has more people, and so for the same income, they should be paying significantly less taxes. That's a very simple conservative argument that doesn't sound like handouts. So I love this debate. I'm, I'm involved in it every day at AEI, talking to heritage people, talking to people on the left as well. I think it's a it's promising that the debate is happening. Well, please individually keep pushing the envelope, and I, and I mean that heartfelt. That it's it's really important to have your voice there. But maybe you know here on the record we can say that we'll have a a heritage AEI conference. We'll go to your place. Y'all can come here. I think to to show that two important institutions in the conservative movement in the United States are honestly grappling with this. I think we would both say on behalf of our colleagues working on this, neither institution believes we have all the answers. I think that's one of the healthy things about American conservatism now. But also, we are very open, both institutions, to any debate, but particularly on this issue, because I believe of all of the policy issues that your institution and mine work on, that is the core of it, because everything else literally becomes immaterial if we don't get this one right. Absolutely. And we, you know, the point, <clears throat> government is there to support individuals, conservatives like to say, but as we were referring to earlier, ultimately, really, that means government is there to support families. And that um, if this, as conservatives were worried, sometimes supporting has bad uh, consequences. Welfare programs, 
uh, often kept people from getting married or kept people from getting jobs. So we just want to say, can we help people without these negative unintended consequences or where the benefit outweighs it? And that's a question that I think to some extent too many conservatives got out of the habit of, of asking um, and fell into a more sort of uh, – a sort of libertarianism that says you can't make me – help my neighbor. And I would think, well, if the government is here to support families, then um, I'm not going to rule it out unless you can show me that it would actually harm the people we're trying to help, which would not be the first time the government did that. So again, we got to have these debates. We got to look at how it works. Got to do it on the state level in the, in the laboratory of democracy. And that's you know, sort of uh, emphasizing what I do and which makes sense given what I've done is, is remember federalism. I think that's a really important logistical way of getting a lot of this done. We'll save the remainder of that conversation for the next time. And uh, and hopefully you'll come back, even though there will be a second 21st century <laughs> Atlanta Braves World Series championship poster in my office. But that said, final question, Tim. There are a lot of challenges in America, in American politics, in our discourse, in our civic life. In spite of that, why'd you wake up smiling today? <laughs> Um, I have, uh, you can't say because the Mets are in first place <laughs> <laughs> and it's only a grin when it's half a game. Um, uh, I have six kids and I got to wake them up and, and feed them breakfast and, and send them off to school. And, uh, my wife got to drop a couple of them off and, and go to mass at the uh, parish where we were married, where she was baptized. Um, and then uh, as I, as I said, I've got a, uh, a great job. I'm here. I'm going to go debate liberals on on public radio in a, in a couple hours. Um, but ultimately, even if I lose that debate, even if you know nothing goes right for us politically or anything, I just wake up thinking God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, and <laughs> for us, and that puts me in a good mood. And the sort of the 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 bigger picture view of that is, uh, yeah. Humans are good. We're just facing tremendously challenging times on the partisanship front and the cultural front. I mean, I think, you know, the reality is, is that our, you know, the academy um, where I where I sit and uh, the media and and much of the sort of the folks who are creating pop culture, you know, lean heavily to the left. Um, and unfortunately, that means that they've they've tended in recent years, particularly since you know what Matthew Glaze has called the Great Awakening. Um, they've, they tended to kind of take what I call a more individualistic approach to life where you want to kind of maximize your personal freedom, keep your options open, not kind of be too invested in marriage or in, in family life. Um, there was a piece in Bloomberg in September basically that said, I mean, falsely said that women who, um, you know, got married and had kids were more likely to be poor or women who didn't have, who didn't get married and didn't have kids were going to be richer. Um, and the and the article in Bloomberg was kind of like suffused with all these examples of single childless women who were flourishing, not just financially, but also emotionally, right? And what was striking about that piece was not only was it false, I mean, empirically, I can show just the opposite of what the thesis of this Bloomberg journalist was articulating, but she tweeted out that very day that she published her piece, a little tweet saying, this is for all my like, you know, friends who are like childless. Like she was clearly signaling that she had an agenda, it was a sort of anti-nuptial, anti-natalist agenda. So my point is simply is that it, the challenge I think is that many of the folks who kind of man the cultural heights in our culture, in the academy and in, in, in the media and elsewhere, just are not all that friendly to marriage and family life and the sacrifices that those things require of us. We're also seeing, I think, among our cultural elites, a profound what I call anti-traditionalism. Like, a, you know, they're just skeptical about anything that's sort of older, not realizing that many of our traditions, of course, not all, but many of them have kind of like emerged over time to help us. So there's like a lot of skepticism about, you know, even like now fidelity, you know, or just the or two people in 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 marriage, um, and yet there's kind of. Or even, for instance, just a more kind of discreet example is there's a lot of skepticism about the, the merits of merging your bank accounts. I've and, been reading a lot about this recently. And, yeah. and you know, they're encouraging couples today to keep separate accounts in, in that spirit of individualism that I was talking about, right? Like you, you've got your money, you know, she's got her money. No recognition that marriage is most likely to be flourishing when there's a we before me mentality. And that applies to money as well. In fact, there was a really great study done by Northwestern psychologists where they randomly assigned young newly married couples to joint checking accounts 
and separate accounts and then just do whatever you want. And of course, the folks who are randomly assigned to have joint checking accounts where they're pooling their money, sharing their money, talking about their money, they were the ones who were much more likely in the first two years of married life as they tracked them over time to be flourishing, right? And so, again, the point I'm making is I think the hard thing about our, our moment is that, you know, many of our friends on the left um, in you know many sectors, including here in Capitol Hill, just don't appreciate the value of what I call familism um, and these core institutions. And so um, it's going to be really challenging for us to address the kinds of divides that you've mentioned. Now, I think the left has assumed as well that as we become a country where there are fewer and fewer married folks, that's going to push the U.S. in the direction of the Democratic Party. And just like they thought that having more like Hispanics and immigrants would push us sort of inexorably towards a democratic agenda and a democratic future, I'm actually now thinking that that's not necessarily the case. And I think what they haven't seen is that yes, women who are not married, especially women who are college educated who are not married, are migrating to the Democratic Party in very substantial numbers, obviously, in recent decades. Um, and I think they're going to continue to migrate. But there are two sexes, right? And what we're seeing, I think, among men who are not married is a, a beginning of a kind of a, a drift towards looking more seriously at conservatives in the Republican Party. And we actually just saw in South Korea, as you probably know, they elected a conservative <clears throat> Um, head of government in South Korea, who was elected um, in part because he generated a lot of um, support among young, unmarried Korean men who, for a variety of reasons, are not happy with the dispensation in South Korea. So my point simply is that I think what's happening in this country is that we could see a kind of um, profound polarization along um, sort of gender and education and uh, family lines where married folks drift more towards the conservative end of things, unmarried folks drift more towards the democratic and liberal end of things, but there's a substantial share of unmarried men who may be kind of beginning to sort of, you know, move to the right because they're not happy with um, a world where, you know, it's harder for them to find a spouse and find their position in this, in this, uh, in this new um, culture. And it seems that when we, we transpose that very informed persuasive speculation you mentioned into politics that the next leaders, the next generation of leaders of conservatism have to speak to that in terms of policy, in terms of messaging, and, and obviously the next opportunity for that to happen in a significant way is the 2024 presidential race, which we will not talk about in, in today's episode, but perhaps the next time we have you back, and I'd love to have you back many times over the years, sure. we can cover the importance of political messaging when it, when it comes to this. So two final questions, Brad. Uh, one is to make sure that audience members know where to track your work, and another plug for your upcoming book. Yeah, so um, I'm also involved with the American Enterprise Institute and also with the Institute for Family Studies. And a lot of work that I do and colleagues do on these issues is at familystudies.org. You can just Google that. Um, I'm on Twitter at Brad Wilcox, uh, IFS. And um, my book is coming out with Harper Collins uh, this summer. It's called Get Married. And um, there's already a little website up at Harper Collins for the book. So, so that's summer of 23. Yeah, so this upcoming summer, the book will be out. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Last question, a little bit of a spin on the last question, which usually is why you're you're hopeful about the future of America. I, I'd ask you, you, although you can answer that, to direct your response to like-minded younger people, mm -hmm. guys and gals younger than you and me, sure. not yet married. Mm -hmm. They they understand what you're saying. They're they're with you. Mm -hmm. And yet they're skeptical that, in fact, it's going to work for them for a host of reasons. What would your response to them be? Yeah, that's a great um, that's a great question. I mean, I think the challenge for younger adults is that there are so few institutions that are kind of um, helping them get to know one another in constructive ways and kind of creating a pathway for them to date and marry. Um, and so, you know, I actually have seen at UVA, surprisingly enough, a, a group of 
students who are kind of organizing um, dances, lectures, other events, all designed to kind of promote, um, you know, dating with an eye towards marriage. Um, they're, they're definitely kind of an exceptional group of young adults, but I've never seen anything like this before at UVA. I've been teaching it, you know, 20 years um, at the University of Virginia. And for the first time in the last couple of years, there's, you know, a group of students who are really kind of trying to help one another um, kind of meet and basically marry, you know, at some point down the road. Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, we need to start being more honest with people about what actually builds um, human flourishing. Hmm. So I don't know so much about the U.S. context, but in the U.K., we've been pretty silent that it is healthy families, actually, that builds um, social, you know, human flourishing. And we haven't really wanted to say this. We've been, we've wanted to say every form and every structure of family is equally, equally um, leads to human flourishing. And, and, and the data just doesn't support that. But at the same time, um, uh, we, you know, obviously people don't necessarily choose different family formats because, you know, it, it, life happens to you. So then it's how do you support people in order to really flourish? But, but we so often are just not even honest with people about um, actually, you know, it's about um, getting married, then having a child, you know, having a job even before that. You know, there, there, is, there are some logical steps to what leads to human flourishing. And, um, and, and we, need to, we need to be open about these, these, these things. Brad Wilcox uh, here in the United States is a great friend of, of your effort with ARC, uh, which we'll talk about momentarily, has done tremendous work yeah. on, on what we call the success sequence. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously there are political policy implications there. But I want to move to the, the flip side of this coin, which is from the standpoint of individuals. In the United States, related to these problems we've just been talking about, the way the shorthand way we would talk about them is to say that Americans believe that they're they're losing grasp on the American dream, yeah, and it has caused a discouragement, if not a despair, yeah. that is palpable. Yeah. Not just in Rust Belt communities, in the United States, you have your corollaries in the UK, but the the, the question is. Is a is there a similar sentiment that's so palpable in the UK? And B, what do center right policymakers need to say yeah. in order to capture the attention, the imagination of of their countrymen to actually address these problems? In other words, at Heritage, we believe the right has ignored these people yeah. and they've ignored these problems for far too long. And at the very least, it's an existential question about political survival. But it, it ought to concern us far more in our heart yes. that we want these people to flourish. Absolutely. How do we fix it? Yeah. So I th I would I would completely agree with that. I mean, like we we have um, a young generation who are losing confidence in the system of capitalism, but they the reality is they have no way of having any share in the system. And you know, I have three children in their in their twenties. And and I I employ numbers of people in their in their twenties. Amazing generation. They are absolutely phenomenal generation. But um, you know their hopes of owning a property and getting on the property ladder is pretty slim in our big cities. So how do how do you locate yourself in a city where you can have the opportunities for growth and development and get on the property ladder? At the same time, these are things that we have to be able to solve for this for this next generation, and um, and we have to uh, alongside that, we've also lost many of our industries that provided really dignified work to some of our um, some of our communities, and they're looking around saying, "Yeah, I'd like to work, but like, where is the?" Where is the um, uh, industry that uses my skills and my talents? And I'm open to retraining and I'm open to all of these things, but like, uh, what am I going to retrain into? And so these are, these are some of the uh, very real challenges and the conversations that we're having. And what was interesting about the art conference is these are, these are, we have the same challenges right across the Anglosphere. And we often tend to think that, oh, that's a UK problem or a US problem or an Australia problem. But actually, you know, listening to the Australians say as well, 
you know, we have the same concept of flyover country in Australia as you have in, in the US and trying to explore what the solutions to those challenges would be. But it starts from a point of actually saying, no, human dignity is such that we can't neglect this. We absolutely have to be finding a way of ensuring dignified work for all of our employees. We've had leaders in, in our respective countries who are great storytellers. Doesn't mean that they aren't firm, that they aren't tough, that they aren't courageous. Those, those, mm -hmm. All those things can go hand in hand, but that as your country and the United States, I wouldn't say are in political crisis, but certainly political challenges, yeah, yeah. right? And th that what, what your countrymen and mine are starving for, frankly, across the political spectrum, deep into the left and yeah. far into the right, is a generation of leaders who can cast that division yeah. and then also implement it. Yeah. And, and those skills, I don't think, are that rare. You know, when you spend time in business and the nonprofit world, in churches, just run into regular Brits and regular Americans, uh, how can we inspire this next generation of potential leaders to be those people we need? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I do think that... Um, uh, I do think that it is about uh, raising up and supporting leaders across the world of business, media, politics, the arts, the academy, to actually work together. I think our sectors have become very um, divided and, and um, sectoral. And um, one of the ways in which change really happens is when those different leaders work together towards the same towards the same objectives. And it is too about creating a community of leaders who can go about that work without getting attacked and knocked out. So one of the things we've seen is, is, is great leaders um, who say what everybody is thinking and then get mobbed on Twitter or mobbed, and, they, and and it damages people. That is that is damaging to people. And so you, you want to support really good leaders to keep going and to keep um, creating the pathway forward. And that, that really is only done not when leaders are working in isolation, but when they are embedded in a community of people working together. Um, so the isolated leader um, standing on a hilltop on their own, it, I, I don't think in today's world will make it. Uh, but communities of leaders building this vision, they will make it. And one of the ways we can we can foster the development and even flourishing of those communities and hopefully the support of those leaders is through institutions. Yeah. And and it's it's a little academic to, to talk about institutional life, but I think the audience of this show is used to that because it's it is my great passion yeah. as an early American historian and as a as a policy leader, if that's what I am now. But the the point is in Britain you have a different history yeah. of institutions because, and I'll let you you do the analysis, but you have a, a long history of redeeming and reclaiming and revitalizing institutions, whereas in the United States, largely because of geography, what we would call the frontier thesis in the United States, we just kept moving west because yeah. it took a long time for us to run out of land. And now that, of course, we've run out of land, there, there's no more new land to build new institutions in. We're struggling with the concept of how to reclaim and redeem institutions. So we need a lesson from our British <laughs> friends. I can't set you up better. <laughs> you can't set me up better. No, so I think um, one of the things um, that we have observed from our conversations with our American friends is that when you, um, uh, when an institution um, turns and is no longer a healthy institution, uh, the mentality is, and I, I, I call it a go west mentality, is to abandon and go and create something new. And uh, we've joked that in the UK, if you do that and you just go west, you end up in the sea within about half an hour. Um, so you can't, you can't do that. But what that means is that in the UK, you have to push back deep into the institution itself and you have to reform it from within. And We've looked back through British history and we've looked at times where the health of our institutions have ebbed and flowed. But actually, um, roughly every hundred years, our institutions have needed to self-renew. And that's not surprising, really. I mean, that's a, a generational kind of turnover. 
and um, uh, people have needed to say actually this institution is no longer going in the way in which it should be going in but I'm in this institution I need to push deep into it and to restore health into it and so our observation would be that um, uh, leaders of, of character with a transformational mindset some of them will collaborate outside of their institutions on extraordinary projects but many are required to push back and deep within their institutions to say, no, this is about restore my, my responsibility is to restore health to my to my institution. And the more people who can do that, the more our institutions will renew from, from within and don't need to be discarded. I mean we have observed that you it's helpful to have the pioneers on the outside calling the standard higher, you know, and saying that um, actually no, we can do better and modelling things, um, but still, let's go for the renewal of our institutions. We'll take that as a lesson. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you one final question, and, and, and I'll ask you, if you don't mind, to address it to this largely American audience, because you are someone who loves this country mm -hmm. deeply, as we love yours. But Americans, the majority of Americans right now are very discouraged. Yeah. It's very unusual for Americans. I mean, this is, it's not in our spirit, as you know well, to be anything but hopeful mm -hmm. about our future, about the future of the world. But because so many Americans, to some extent, with some good reason, have bought into that if we're not in decline, we're on the brink of it, that's also a very unusual mm. sentiment by Americans. It's dangerous it's for us dangerous. as a civil society. Mm. Why did you wake up this morning in Washington, D.C., no doubt hopeful mm. about the American future? Yeah, yeah. Oh. First of all, this is an incredible nation with an extraordinary history. And um, uh, we often go around your remarkable museums and we love learning about the history of your nation. It's a complex history. Um, it's, uh, you know, we've spent time in the African American museums here and also down in Selma and um, and Birmingham, Alabama, and we've we've sought to learn about the complexity of the history and in the Native American uh, Museum as well, trying to really understand the complexity of of um, of this nation. But this nation, and your, the way you tell your story is incredible because it it is founded on the principles of freedom, and it is it is you also come at it with a humility of it's a story that we are still telling and we are still bringing in the freedoms every step of the way when we discover areas that are not free we are re restoring freedom and the only way to progress forward in my in my understanding and, and i've said this to you before is is founding principle on the dignity of the human being that the the profound remarkable, extraordinary dignity of every human being. And, and that is a founding principle of this nation. And then built on that is the principles of freedoms, uh, freedom of conscience, um, freedom of um, speech, uh, freedom to exchange ideas and sharpen one another's ideas. So even where we have gone wrong or where America may have gone wrong, the fact that you have freedom of speech and the freedom to exchange ideas means that you can self-correct along the way as well. If you shut that down through intolerance, you lose the ability to progress and to self-correct. And so I, I, I profoundly believe that if you can keep that dialogue going, that free exchange of ideas, that, that the state has the most incredible future ahead, but keeping hold of freedom of conscience freedom of speech, freedom of the, of the exchange of ideas, that's the pathway to, to progressing. Yes, the institutions need to be revived, right? Yes, as community, members of a community or even a family, we, we can talk to one another about certain things, but one of the things that's needed more than anything else is just a sense of courage, um, because I think courage begets courage in the same way that fear begets fear. Um, so when you see someone like Macy Gray fold so publicly, um, it's good to know that there are Barry Weisses out there who, who will stand, uh, stand in the gap and stand courageously on this particular issue, even as you said, even if we don't agree on every other issue. 
That's well said. And, and I think about you know, your, your examples of Macy Gray and, and Barry Weiss, but I also think about how illustrative the example of Eric Adams is mm. because there was very little about Eric Adams' career that would suggest that he was anything but a centrist or a center left guy. Correct, correct. And those of us on the right had every reason. I mean, I, I have said this publicly, mm -hmm. certainly not any kind of endorsement, which I can't do as the head of a C3, but I just had great hope for him. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, given his profile, his personal achievement, that he was going to be really important for that for that city. And so much so I thought, man, this guy's got a bright political future, but even he was co-opted mm. by the radical left. Right? right. And, but the good news is for, it seems as if for every Eric Adams, we have a Ron DeSantis mm. and DeSantis has come up in a couple of our conversations right. today, public panel. We had a, a lunch we were having with some friends and, 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 and actually the headline would be his courage. Yes. That, that courage, I mean, imagine this is the governor of Florida mm -hmm. taking on not just any corporation, right. not just any business right. that happens to have a whole bunch of special tax breaks, but Disney. Mm -hmm. I mean, what many people around the world would almost associate with American identity itself. itself right. And he took them on and he won. Yes. There's a lesson there, isn't there? Uh, absolutely. I mean, so, so one of the lessons is, is the problem, right? The problem is that as is the case in other parts of the society, um, corporations have forgotten their place, right? So I, I think back to Mitt Romney when he said, you know, corporations are people too. Th that was in the age in which corporate interests neatly aligned with, you know, conservatism in the Republican Party. We're no longer in that age and people need to understand what time it is. So we're in an age now where um, the CEO and the HR director at any Fortune 500 company are thoroughly in bed with the Democratic Party, right? So things have changed so much that the, the upper management of these companies is fully leftist. And it's the working class who now need a new political home because it's, it's the workers, it's the guys who drop off and deliver the water who are being subjected to these crazy... Um, uh, DEI training sessions about uh, you know, being anti-racist and so on and so forth, right? They're the ones who have to sit through a Robin DiAngelo's, DiAngelo seminar. Um, so part of it is understanding the way the dynamics are, are shifting in our political culture. Any conservative that thinks that corporate, corporate America is on its side um, is fooling themselves. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if every Fortune 500 company signed off on the Equality Act in terms of support. If it's not every, it's the vast majority of them made those public commitments. So, so that's one part of it, right? How, how the landscape is changing. But the other part of it, to your point, is the courage that Governor DeSantis showed in facing down Disney and the teachers unions and encouraging the restoration of public order when he said, look, if you're a police officer in, in one of these other cities who want to defund the police, we'll take you on and we'll give you a nice little bonus. Um, those are all things I think that other other governors um, should be be uh, emulating, because it's the type of thing that you you need. It's not just about political rhetoric. And and one of the things that I've noticed is that um, both on a national and even local level, a, a lot of our politics have devolved into entertainment. It's all about who can have a viral moment. It's all about who has the quickest quip. But it's like no, we elect people to represent our values and our interests. We don't elect them so that we can get on board with their agenda and advancing their career and help them sell their books. Uh, so, so I think Governor DeSantis is probably better than anyone else that I could think of, and certainly on the conservative side, um, mixes the ability to uh, sort of engage in rhetorical jujitsu with actual tangible policy wins. And that, to me, should be a model for, for any other governor of any other state. I agree with that. And in a lot of ways, DeSantis personifies where I think the conservative movement isn't just going, but where it is it present is. tense. Yeah. You know, yeah. <clears throat> I've been saying for a little while, along with, with others who are smarter than me, that the conservative movement is going to be a multi-ethnic, more working class coalition than it's mm -hmm. ever been. Being you know, a guy from a, a working class family that at best lived paycheck to paycheck on mm -hmm. the Gulf Coast, I, I can relate to that. I can mm -hmm. understand that because of my experience. But so it makes perfect sense to me. But when DeSantis takes on Disney, mm. 
regular common sense Americans say, that's my guy mm -hmm. because that's how life is. Yeah. And we're tired of, you know, all the fancy nuanced talk of the politicians, of the academics and so on. But all of that to say, I think the more that we can conservatism can be the movement of people who shower after work mm. rather than before work, mm. the better off we are. Yeah, now, that's a great point. Someone's in the audience and say, well, I shower before work. Well, we want you to, <laughs> but you, you get the point. Or shower at work. Yeah, yeah sure. Oh, there you go. That yeah. might mean you got to have a gym at work. Yeah, that, that, that's good too. Yeah. But as we think about uh, kind of wrapping up here, although I would talk to you for a few hours, mm -hmm. a couple, couple last questions. Sure. And, and the one in a lot of ways I'm most interested in asking you, and not just because you're a black American, mm -hmm. but because you're thoughtful, my own academic work for what it's worth is on the African-American family. Mm. And so I've spent my entire professional career studying. And what inspired wow. me to do that was the Moynihan Report, mm. the 1960s. And then as a historian, I worked backwards into the 1700s, right. a period that you study, you, you know well. But most sociologists, of course, have taken that forward to the, the 21st century. But because I'm now equally interested in the future of conservatism, mm -hmm. I think about how difficult it is for especially white conservatives, mm. to talk about racial tensions. And I think probably the thing that got me following you on Twitter and reading you know, almost everything that you've written is that you're so thoughtful about that. And so I just kind of want to give you the, the floor here, Delano, to, to give us a lesson about how we can do that in a way that's not for political purposes. I want right. to be really clear because that's not why you're saying mm -hmm. it. It's not why I'm asking it. But so that we can build community mm -hmm. and so that this movement, which reflects objective truth, can speak to racial tensions in a way that helps to heal them. Yeah. So, so for me, any conversation about race, I situate firmly in my Christian faith because I believe in Genesis 127, Genesis 127, when it says that God created male and female in his own image, that's all of us. We all have the same common creator, right? So we may have different skin tones and different shades and come from different countries, but our worth and value comes from the fact that we were made by the same God. Um, that being said, I mean, race has always been an issue, you know, in, in our country. Race and racism have always been issues. But, but I think a thoughtful way to think about it um, is to juxtapose the anti-racism of Dr. Ibram Kendi with the anti-racism of Frederick Douglass. Um, Kendi's anti-racism says that any disparity between racial groups is caused by racist policy. Um, he removes all agency from black Americans. His, his, his story is basically, you know, if, if there are differences in educational outcomes, it's because of racist policy. So in that sense, um, you know, black folk become objects, right, who are acted upon, never individual agents who can do for themselves. Frederick Douglass, on the other hand, is a man who, at the height of his career as an abolitionist, was saying, look, if we, if, when, when and if the slaves are emancipated, allow them to do things for themselves. He said, at, at every turn, our white brothers and sisters have always offered benevolence instead of justice, right? So when I, when I read Douglas, I see a man who says, look, again, all the same creator, right? All of our lives have inherent worth and value. But we should, and because of that, we should be subjected to the same laws as any other man. Don't, don't rob my opportunity to take responsibility for my own life because you know you would never do it for yourself, right? So I, I think one of the ways that we can talk about race is to situate it in, in those realities that we come from the same creator and that there's no such thing as equality in a society in which one group is subjected to a different set of standards than everyone else. You can't have equality that way. Now, the left will say that they want racial equality that way, but th it, that's really a sort of a, a paternalistic approach to what they call equality. Uh, it's paternalistic hierarchy. That's really what it is. So, so for me, when I think about race, I think about seeing people as, again, as image bearers, first and foremost. Um, I, I don't believe in racializing common human behavior. I don't think any race or ethnicity has a monopoly on any verse or, or on any vice or virtue, right? So I don't, I don't racialize anger. Um, I don't racialize fatherlessness. Um, I don't racialize, you know, crime, 
Um, and I think there are ways in which we can see the commonality that runs through all of these issues. And I think that is one way that you can build partnerships and coalitions. But a lot of times on both the left and the right, there's a desire to insert um, race where it shouldn't be. Now, that doesn't mean we can't talk about culture. And that's different. And I know you, you and I, you know, we've talked about that, that video going around from Minneapolis. We had some very young children, happened to be black kids, who were, you know, cursing at and, and hitting police officers. And, and to me, it's like th that could happen in any community. That doesn't mean it's equally likely that it would happen in every, any community. So what is possible doesn't mean uh, just because something is possible here doesn't mean it's equally prevalent everywhere else. But I think if we want to address our issues, to your point, you talked about Moynihan, um, we should see them from that, that common perspective because the, the white out of wedlock birth rates in America today are higher than the black ones were when Moynihan issued basically a national call to action. Um, it's unfortunate that crisis has to be the thing that brings us together, but, but I think it's possible if, if we see each other, again, as, as cre created by the same God, as capable of the same levels of agency, away with this nonsense that someone is privileged um, just because of their skin color or that they are eternally oppressed because of their skin color. Uh, I think accepting any of those narratives is, is toxic, uh, particularly for the body politic. And, and really, it's like I, I'm trying to raise my, I have a daughter and two sons. I, I'm trying to raise my children um, to engage with everyone confidently. But if I tell them that their skin color makes them oppressed or that people are going to dislike them or hate them or resent them, um, when they go out into the world, they'll always be begging for the affirmation of people that they don't know. And that's actually one of the unintended consequences of um, uh, sort of the dis disintegration of the nuclear family, particularly in the black community. You know, you and I both know this. One of our, primar our two primary roles are protection and provision. When fathers are not there and um, you substitute the father's role, and, and, or you give the father's role to, to external parties, what ends up happening is that you have, um, particularly, I'm, I'm thinking, particularly in the black community, every time I saw a black person demand that a white person affirm that black lives matter, I hear the echo of a fatherless child. Because part of what a father does is affirm his children. And he says, your life has value. And when you're not getting that in your own home or your neighborhood or community, you have to go seek it from somewhere else. And you have to seek it from government or you have to seek it from the people who you think are um, the ones who are going to help free you and liberate you. Um, and so that's why, uh, again, I I'm, I'm totally on board with the notion that to save the republic, we have to rescue the American family. Um, and I think that is something that everyone, regardless of race, color or creed, can, can get. <laughs>